My name is Sergen Spasovic, movie director, and you're listening to Without Your Head. Welcome to the station of decapitation without your head. I'm Nasty Neal, and I'm joined by Mark Scheffler, who is junior in Laos House on the Left. And you can come and see him in person at Texas Freightmare Weekend, May 4th through the 6th in Dallas. How are you doing? I'm fine. Yourself? I'm very good. Very good. The weather's, uh, well, it's not very nice, but at least I have power. So you're you're a little, you said you're about an hour away from Boston? Yeah. Yeah. yeah I, my wife and I love Boston. Very cool. Just just right before this interview is accepted as press for Boston Underground Film Festival. So I'm, I'm very excited oh, about that. Yeah. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, real quick, uh, you said about you and your wife loving Boston. Uh, how often do you guys go and what, what are some of the things you like to do in Boston? Um, we go, I think, a couple of times a year. We try to get out there uh, over the last, you know, two, three years. Um I like the the topography. I like the construction of the city. I like the Freedom Trail. I like the restaurants. I like, uh, you know, it's New England, and I'm a seafood mm-hmm. guy. So, you know, oh, where, yeah, you, where, where else do you get great New England seafood but in New England? Exactly. Uh, you know, and, and it's a walking city, and my wife and I are both, <laughs> you know, very active. So uh, uh, we, it's, it's a place we'd love to walk around. Yeah, yeah, it's very easy to walk around or take the the public transportation or uh, just about everywhere. So yeah, that's cool. Uh, so uh, for Last House on the Left, which uh, how did you get involved in the movie? Um, I was an actor slash stand up in in New York back in the uh, you know late sixties and early seventies, and I had a manager. Uh, same management company that was handling Tom Jones and Engelbert Humperdinck, if you can believe it, uh, <laughs> at the uh-huh. time, Lloyd Greenfield. And he had a, a, a fellow working for him, uh, Dick Towers, uh, who handled uh, everybody. That's an excellent but, name, by the way. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I know. It's like a porn name, right? <laughs> uh, um, he handled everybody who wasn't Engelbert Humperdinck and Tom Jones. Which, in, which included me. So I walked into his office one day and uh, he said, hey, I got a movie audition for you. I said, great. Told me where to go. Gave me the address. I uh, went down on Fifth Avenue uh, in the 40s somewhere right off of Fifth and uh, went into a building, met two guys named uh, Sean and Wes, mm-hmm. uh, read a scene, walked out, said thank you, walked out, uh, got back uh, uh, to Dick's office, and by the time I had gotten back there, they had already called and uh, said, that's the guy we want. So <laughs> that's how. Yeah. So do you remember what scene it was that you read for? I do, actually. Um, it, was the, it was the scene where Junior is sleeping and having the dream about what's happened, and he screams, mm-hmm. uh, you know, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Yeah. So that, that was the scene I read. Mm-hmm. How close did did you like? Uh, I don't want to say like how close you were to the character because that would be very strange. But how close did you like look to how you looked as Junior? Like, uh, did you dress the same way or anything? They were my pants in the film. It was oh, okay. My, uh, the T-shirt and pants that I wore belonged to me. Uh, uh, so uh, you know, I wasn't. Uh, you know, I wasn't a heroin junkie in real life. <laughs> right. Well, that's good. <laughs> but. And I wasn't as sloppy as, as yeah, that yeah. character. But, you know, I pretty much looked like that guy. Uh-huh. So when you first read the script, um, what did you think of it? And what kind of what kind of movie did you think like uh, going in would be made? Was uh, it the I, same as the movie you made? Or? No, of course not. That, 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 we had no idea what because we only looked at uh, uh, pages. They're called sides. Uh, uh, so we only the, the people who reading. We only saw a few pages. We didn't have an entire script to read. And then uh, uh, after we were all cast and we all got copies of the script, the original title of which, by the way, was Sex Crime of the Century, which uh, was about as on the nose as you can get. Uh-huh. Uh, and we all kind of uh, independently uh, and then collectively as a group, we mean the cast, said to Sean and Wes, yeah, I don't think we're going to do this. <laughs> <laughs> Because it, it had some very weird shit in there. And, uh, you know, it just, it's not like we were, we weren't afraid of doing it. It just mm-hmm. didn't look like, it, 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 it didn't look like anything that could be fun to do. It just looked like bullshit. So, so Wes, to his credit, you know, uh, 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 took 
our feedback and uh, went out and wrote the script that pretty much was the framework for what the film ended up being. Yeah. Do you remember anything particular that stood out? Like, we definitely don't want to do this. I think there was some... Uh, there was some there was some porn stuff that just was was written outrageously pornographic. You know, like I I don't know if that makes any sense to you, but I've I've seen porn scripts and and perhaps have consulted on a few as a writer. <laughs> and uh, I, even in the writing, you try to have a little uh, uh, craft. But this was uh, uh, on the nose, on the ass, on the dick, on every. It was on every. <laughs> it was as direct as could be and we just said no there's just there's, there's no real fun here so yeah. yep actually speaking of that, fun and uh maybe this makes me sound crazy but uh, i've seen the movie a bunch of times before but i watched it uh yesterday specifically for the interview the day before yesterday and um i never noticed there's so much dark humor in the movie did, did oh, yeah. you pick up yeah like uh that's i think it's definitely intentional uh did you know that going into the movie or when you made it yes. that <laughs> is that something that that appealed to you? You have to. Yes, I. I of course, uh, all kinds of humor uh, uh, appeals to me. The dark, the especially dark humor. But mm -hmm. you know, we were. You have to put everything in context. Uh, Sean had made one movie before, a film called Together, which was kind of a pseudo, a pseudo documentary starring his father as some uh, sexual researcher uh, uh, that Wes edited. And, and Wes had only been editing and, n you know, nobody, the only person who had actually made movies before uh, uh, on the, you know, above the line side was uh, Freddie. Uh, Freddie had done a lot of porn movies and had, had had done some legitimate stuff, too. So Freddie had the the most uh, uh, or the deepest knowledge of filmmaking of, of any of us. Mm -hmm. And it's uh, it, before anyone thinks I'm like insane, like. When I say dark humor, I obviously mean like the, the rape scene and stuff. But uh, pretty much everything else I find like very comical in the movie. In, in a good way, though. It's uh, well, even the, I, straight down to the music. Yeah, that was... Uh, um, Wes's, Wes had some original creative intents, as I uh, uh, recall. And that was, number one, to bring violence down stage center uh, in front of the audience's faces instead of having it kind of be soft-pedaled and in the background and very unrealistic and the second was realizing that he was doing that you 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 had to allow the audience to breathe and allow them relief uh uh to, because you can't just do this for 88 minutes straight you sure, have to sure. you have to break it up and and get them ready for the next uh you know like a if like a roller coaster ride you know uh, it's it's very similar uh that you have to give yeah. people a chance to relax so that you can fuck with them again yeah, I think it works, too, because, like, um, some people watch a movie, like myself, have watched movies where it's got a lot of violence in, and you just watch it and enjoy it, and not really think that it's necessarily violence, it's just an enjoyable movie. And this kind of sets you up for that with, like, the kind of silly music and how the, um, but good music, and how, like, the uh, the parents are very flippant about, hey, you better watch out and all this stuff. But then when it is time for, like, the real uh, hardcore stuff, it's very somber, and it really kind of like kind of makes you look kind of look at yourself. I think like, hey, I find this stuff enjoyable. What you know, what what does this really say about me? Well, I, as far as the parents being flippant, that, good note there. Um, I think I think that was Wes shining a light on parents, uh, uh, some parents of that generation who were who were uh, kind of just dismissive of their children as human beings and, and only viewed them as their children. You know what I mean by that? Yeah. 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 Cause uh, I, cause I think, you know, people try to like want to be uh, friends with their kids instead of necessary parents. And right. they kind of, you know, and it's like, Hey, you know, better watch out, but not really even caring that much. Cause they, you don't think something's actually going to happen. And, and then it did. So it's, it's a, you know, it's a, there's a lot there besides just the, the violence in the movie. Oh no, it's a, it's a true cautionary tale. You know, it was derived from, uh, Ingmar Spring. Bergman's, Ingmar Bergman's The Virgin Spring, which was then derived from, uh, I think it's an 11th century Swedish, uh, a folk tale that was written as a, a cautionary tale for young women and people. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Have you ever seen that? I've actually not seen The Virgin Spring. I definitely I should have. watch that. I have. Yeah. 
long time ago and and several times since. Yeah. Were you aware of it when you when you took the role? I was aware of it after I took the role because uh, I had uh, an intellectual curiosity as to where all this came from. And Wes said Ingmar Bergman's The Virgin Spring, you know, and then yeah. I, after he said that, I, I watched it. Mm -hmm. uh, so did you watch it before like you uh, filmed the movie? Um, that was I, don't it after? I don't remember. Yeah. Yeah, I just didn't know if you took anything from that for your role. Um, uh, just my Swedish accent. <laughs> Which you nailed perfectly. Of like. course, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, uh, what it's were like your... Subtle, but, but there. Yeah, exactly. What were your initial thoughts uh, on Wes Craven? Oh, well, Wes is a cool guy. Uh, he's, a, he's a sweet guy. I mean, uh, I, saw, I, I, I liked him back then, and I ran into him a couple of times uh, uh, through the years, and then about a year before he passed away, I saw him. Uh, he and I were both invited to an art gallery opening opening by an artist who had done some multimedia renderings of of uh, uh, moments of Wes's films. So we ended up being at the same place at the same time. And I, I must say that he was. He looked at me and smiled, and I looked at him and smiled and. <laughs> gave each other a hug and I looked up at him and I, I said, so, so what have you been up to all these years? And he laughed. <laughs> he said, yeah, you know, goofing around here and there. <laughs> and it, it, mm -hmm. he, he was, it was a, it was a wonderful moment. I, I, I owe a lot to him and to Sean for, for giving this to me. And, um, I, I have nothing but nice things to say about him. Yeah. Something I've always wondered about him. <clears throat> I've never asked anybody, uh, do you know if he had like a thing for booby traps? Because I've noticed when rewatching a lot of his movies, uh, it comes up so often. It comes up in this. It came up in um, The Hills Have Eyes. It's in uh, Nightmare on Elm Street. Uh, everyone's you know, making booby traps. Well, he, he, um, let me see how to say it. All of us, I think, in the entertainment business who were, you know, on the creative side, and I, I can only speak for that because that's, those are the people I've interacted with most. Mm -hmm. We're mostly children in adult bodies. <laughs> right. And, uh, um, you know, one of, one of the biggest gratitudes in life that I have is that I've able, been able to live my life like a teenager with a really big allowance. So uh, uh, I think Wes liked to do things like that because that was tapping his kind of inner child mm -hmm. and, and um, just being fun and just fucking with people and having fun with it. Yeah, yeah, I, I like it in uh, in the movie because uh, for a couple reasons, like you wouldn't even expect that the, this guy, the the dad, would even know anything about booby traps. Right, but he's like this, and then a lot of them really are, are pointless. Like the the guy slips a little bit, but it doesn't really you know make any difference, right. in the, which I find very uh, humorous. We all thought it was humorous when David when we were shooting it too. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, what was David like, by the way, David Hess? Oh. I don't know if we have enough time. Um, <laughs> David was he. David was my my life's big brother. Uh, we became friends immediately, and we stayed friends until he passed away. Uh, he was a complex, talented, wacky bull in the china shop of life kind of person. Mm -hmm. um, he was extraordinarily talented musically. Mm -hmm. Uh, he was a guy who was at times his own worst enemy at times his own best friend. But if he was your friend, uh, he was always your friend. Uh, he was just a, you know, I, I miss him every day and, and, uh, um, over the course of any given month shed a tear for him quite often. I, it's one of the major relationships of my life that, that, um, I miss because he was such a cool guy. I mean, such yeah. a just some just somebody who was a presence in my life and a presence in anyone's life uh, uh, w with whom he was friends. Mm -hmm. Now, did you stay? You must have stayed in contact with him then after the movie, or oh, absolutely. We, uh, you know, we stayed friends uh, for forty years. Yeah, uh, huh. you know, yeah, that, that's cool. Yeah, did um, you know? Obviously, he's not here to say this, but uh, how did he look at the movie? And did his David? view of the yeah, and how, did his view of the movie change over time? Well, yeah, I, everybody's view of the all of our views of the movie changed 
from, right. from the time we made it to the top first time we saw it till we all saw that Roger Ebert review. And suddenly, <laughs> you know, suddenly we were in a real movie. <laughs> and, whoa, how did this shit happen? Right. Uh, so David had a, David was a really smart, you know, kind of eclectic semi or not semi, but intellectual in some, some areas. So he would kind of, look at things in its big picture and and don't forget david did the music so yeah, yeah. his interaction with the film was not just as a, a performer doing that part but if you want to know david's range a, as a as a creative soul well look at him think picture him in the rape scene okay mm -hmm. uh and then listen to some of that music that he wrote to accompany the rape scene, and mm -hmm. and you see that uh, how wide a range uh, uh, artistically and soulfully that is, mm -hmm. and yeah. that pretty much that pretty much defined David's personality. Mm -hmm. uh, to, speaking of uh, the Ebert review, so uh, what, well, first of all, the first time you saw the finished movie, what did you think of it? What the fuck is this? <laughs> <laughs> No, I remember because we went to a, a I, I'm telling you, we went to a screening room on the west side of Filmway's screening room and we saw it and we were uh, stunned, you know, that that's what it was because it really, I mean, we knew what we were shooting, you know, no yeah. doubt about that. But, you know, I, I had never seen a film, you know, fully mastered and put together. So I, I had no idea what to expect. But, you know, we said, well, you know, it is what it is. Uh, who knows? And then, you know, it, it, it was released, and I forget the exact period of time between its actual release and the Ebert's review, but during that time, you know, it had started to do business, and uh, then Ebert's review came out, and whoa. <laughs> <laughs> so, well, well, give people an idea of if, they, if they've never read it, or, or I don't know if, he, if it was ever on the show or not, but uh, what kind of review did he give the movie? I think it was a four star review or three and a half star. Some major. He started. Yeah. See what Ebert did was uh, he deconstructed it in in a uh, in a way that in terms that I had never heard before. Mm -hmm. You know, I remember I was like a twenty one year old actor comedian uh, uh, who left college with three life goals. You know, one smoke as much weed as possible. <laughs> uh, two. Uh, uh, sleep with as many different women as possible, and three, make just enough money to afford the weed and the women. <laughs> right, right. So there I was in a movie that Roger Ebert mentions me, and and suddenly I have greatly exceeded my own expectations. Uh -huh. uh, so I, I, it was actually the first time I had ever thought of a film. As more than just like you know, like a movie. Uh, it was the for first time that that I had ever seen anyone deconstruct a film uh, in in its component parts and put it back together again uh, on paper as something that I had never seen before. Uh -huh. so, so, so I assume after that comes out, does a does a movie? Uh, I know people are going to see it anyway, but does that does that make it a bigger like hit at the box office? Oh yeah. Oh, mm -hmm. fuck yeah, man. Dave, Hess and I, Hess and I had an apartment up on 85th Street and uh, on 85th Street between Central Park West and Amsterdam. And um, once the movie hit New York or prior to it hitting New York, uh, uh, it had done a lot of business. So they papered the city with one sheets of David and, and his face. David literally couldn't walk anywhere <laughs> in the city without people staring at him and then running away from him. So, yeah, that that happened all the time on subways, on buses. We used to have the, the biggest kick about that, that they would just run away from him. So it was it was fucking amazing. Yeah. Literally, it was amazing. Mm -hmm. Uh, does that does that equal any um, any like a uh, money for you guys when the movie's doing better? Uh, not, not in those deals. I, uh, yeah. um, when, uh, to give you an idea, you know, like, uh, of what, what our pay was, I had worked two weeks, the whole shoot was four weeks and I had worked two weeks and had a couple of days off, went back from Connecticut into the city to cash the check, went to the bank, presented it to the teller. And he looked at me and said, how would you like this, sir? Heads or tails? <laughs> 
Uh-huh. So that uh, that gives you an idea. No, uh, um, it has it. It didn't. Yeah. Uh, does Does that ever bother you, or did it bother you at, at, during different times? Look, you know, I'm I'm 68 years old. I've had a really interesting career. I've mm-hmm. I've I've had what I call a, a very successful mediocre career. You know, like I I didn't work on any really really big hit TV shows, but I always worked, so I'm fine. Mm-hmm. I, I don't. I don't look at things in the past with an eye that, gee, I wish I coulda, woulda, shoulda. Sure. I look at things as they were that got me to where I am. So who the fuck cares? It's just mm-hmm. an, it's, it's a major experience in my life and it, it, it is what it is. So, you know, no, I, I don't I have no uh, uh, regrets of shit like that. No. Sure. But uh, you had mentioned, you know, all of you had uh, changed how you saw the movie over the years. Was there ever a point where you just didn't want to talk about the movie or were you always cool, cool with being in it? I, you know, I, I was pretty much always cool being in it. Uh, I, I guess, I don't know what that says about me, whether I have like really low standards <laughs> or something, but again, I view everything, you know, I, I view everything as like a life journey and that was just, uh, an interesting place on my life journey that, you know, led to other things for me. So why would I, I mean, it, it's something I did 40 years, 42 years ago or however long it was, sure. uh, uh, what is this? This is 1971. So however long that, that's a long time. I don't care. I mean, it's, you know, it's part of my personal history. So, you know, I didn't get arrested for it. I didn't get thrown in jail for it. I didn't catch any diseases from it. Uh-huh. Uh, so, uh, yeah, good experience. Yeah. Uh, Mitch and uh, David Hess, well, how about the, the rest of the cast? Did you stay in contact with them? And what was your uh, relationship with most of the people? Uh, let me see. When I moved to California in 76, the first person to drive me around was Marty Cove. Uh, uh, Marty was here already and had started you know, acting and was getting roles. And, uh, I, I had written a script, uh, for a producer. I did a commercial for, uh, which sold to NBC. So I was now out here and I, I got a hold of Marty and Marty drove me around. And then, uh, uh, Freddie was here and I, and so, yeah, I stayed in the, the I don't, I have except for, uh, uh, Jeremy Dreyfus, uh, who I did stay in contact with uh, and still do. Uh, the two girls, uh, I haven't talked to since the film, but as far as the rest of the cast, pretty much. Yeah. i see, I've seen everybody through the years. Dick Towers passed away. The guy, Dick Towers, my, my manager, he yeah. actually, you know, was Gaylord St. James. He played the father in this movie. Oh, nice. <laughs> yeah. He got a role for himself. Uh, <laughs> so he took a, a porn name, Dick Towers and then had a greater <laughs> porn name, Gaylord St. <laughs> James. Okay. He one upped himself. Uh, so, and, and I, I had seen him through the years. He, his daughter lived out here and he used to come out here. So I'd see him, but mostly David and then, and then Freddie and then Jeremy, uh, and then Marty cause, uh, intermittently cause Marty, you know, works a lot and is, mm-hmm. is in and out of town. Yeah. Uh, about um, Marty. Cause the, uh, the, the, the police are really just bumbling fools in the movie and they even have like their accompanying, uh, theme kind of. Uh, yes. And Marty in particular, I notice he always has his uh, his gun is always like right in front of his crotch, which I find very humorous. And uh, Marty's a there, funny guy. Yeah. Do you know if that was his choice or if that was uh, Wes's or do you know anything about that? I I don't know, but I knew Wes and I knew Marty and I know Marty and I would probably say Marty. Yeah. Yeah. yeah my, that know- would, my, that'd be a guess of mine. You know if there's ever any backlash from uh, from police because they have they are portrayed very just uh, very dumb. No, uh, no. never heard anything like that. Yeah. It's probably not their kind of film to begin with, I guess. Well, no crime to solve, that's for sure. So, you know. <laughs> right. Uh, but you mentioned uh, Jeremy, who will also be at the um, at uh, at Texas Frightmare. Uh, so you kept in contact with her. Now there's yes. a there's a I don't assume it was her, but there's a. So they told me not to mention their name, but a former guest wanted to uh, me to ask you: Is it true that you held an actress over a cliff and said you're you're not acting scared enough? You better, <laughs> or I'll throw you off. And I assume that was not her. Um. Yes, that is true. Okay. 
<laughs> I mean, to the best of my recollection, I mean, you know I mean, I'll tell you what happened. Uh, yeah, yeah, please, thank you. <laughs> um, we were shooting the scene where uh, uh, Mary was trying to escape, and uh, the location that we had, we were seated safely. I might, I want to add, we we weren't in any danger, but uh, uh, camera sees things differently. Uh, we were seated on kind of a cliff over uh, a ledge. Uh, that that was uh, above a a creek a flowing creek so uh, this is the scene where she's trying to get away and she's trying to convince me to let her go so Wes shoots my single which is me alone in the frame Uh, he shoots a master and then he shoots starts going in for what's called coverage which is the singles and other shots and he um, shoots mine and we get through it and sets up to do the reverse which is her and sh- she's not rising to the level of tension that mm-hmm. should be in the scene. You know, she's not pushing me hard enough. She does, she's not scared. So uh, um, Wes was getting a little frustrated. It was getting to be late. We had done a bunch of t- takes, you know, and, and uh, wasn't going anywhere. So I just had an idea. And I said to Wes, listen, watch my hand behind me. Uh, and when I move my hand, start the camera. Just, pre- you know, and uh, uh, I said to her, look, and I grabbed her and I pushed her over. I was holding her, but I pushed her kind of over where she was little over the cliff and that she got scared. You know, anybody would be scared at that. So mm-hmm. so I said, if you don't do this, then um, uh, I'm going to push you. I'm going to just push you. I'm crazy. I'm on drugs. I'm crazy. I'm going to push you. And, uh, um, you know, it, it's not that far. It's 10, 15 feet, 20 mm-hmm. feet. No, you probably won't die, but you might get cracked up. <laughs> right. Uh, she's, no, no, please don't. No, no, please. No, no, please don't. Come on, you're, don't do it. So then I picked her up, you know, moved my hand, and we started the scene. And I think that's the scene. That's the take that we got. <laughs> that, it's all worked show. out for the best, right? Yes, of course. I mean, I, I didn't, I, I want to stress something that, that I didn't, she wasn't really in any danger of going over there. There right. was plenty of room, but part of her upper body was leaning uh, on, uh, over, over the edge. So, you know, yeah. I don't want to think anyone, I was cruel to anyone. I was just <laughs> tired and, you know, we were all, you know, wanted to get the fuck out of there and get on to the next business. Yeah. What was that like uh, filming out in the woods? And then obviously, you know, filming, you know, the rape scenes. Well, you know, I didn't get a chance to film any rape scenes because, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I wasn't in the raping business. I was just in the shooting heroin business. Uh, (laughs) um, I got to tell you, man, I learned the the fundamentals and foundation of everything I've I've, I know about filmmaking in that four weeks. I got a chance to see how things even in its primitive form, even even without all the bells and whistles uh, of a big, you know, rich production, all of the basic you know, fundamentals are the same. Uh, so I, it was just glorious. I mean, I don't know how to, you know, that being in production is, uh, is an amazing surge of energy from, from start to finish, you know, from the, Mm -hmm. from the night before the pre-production ends until somebody calls picture wrap. Uh, it's, it's a, uh, really focused, energetic, uh, pedal to the metal time. So, yeah. So you, you, you mentioned, uh, you know, before you started filming it, you guys all went to Wes about, uh, redoing the script. Uh, was there anything while you guys were filming that like, uh, he wanted to film that you guys w- were against anything like that? Not me personally. I think, I think, uh, Sandra had some objections to some stuff that is, as a matter of fact, I recall, uh, she, she walked out at one point. Uh, she, she left the set. She ran away and was hitchhiking back to New York. And uh, uh, Freddie uh, knew her, so uh, they. Uh, I think Sean and Wes sent Freddie to go find her. Uh, mm-hmm. They they were, you know, they would object every now and then. I don't think she was very happy at the the scene between uh, uh, Jeremy and her. You know, when when uh, Jeremy and, and was telling Lucy to to go down on her and and mm-hmm. do you know, I, I don't think she was real happy with that. But you know, she soldiered on through it, and it is what it is. Yeah. Uh, how about for, uh, just for your character for junior, uh, where did you get like the mannerisms and how to act as being a junkie? Well, I walked, you know, once I got the part, 
there, there used to be a place in New York City called Needle Park. Mm-hmm. Uh, it, it, there was a movie with Al Pacino actually called Panic in Needle Park, and mm-hmm. it was up on the on the Upper West Side. Uh, um, and I just went there and just watched. I just kind of watched and saw, and you know, just absorbed mannerisms and you know saw how people acted and how they talked and you know what their what their rhythms were and their movements and i just you know i was just learning so i figured well fuck i'll just copy that yeah uh, this is a weird question but do you miss the old new york do i when you what do you mean by that are you familiar with the movie um uh blood sucking freaks it's a 70s no. exploitation no. movie it's very I'm not, strange i'm not uh, all right well it's an excellent movie you should watch it but uh, we went and uh, interviewed the director from that uh, in New York and Manhattan where he lives. And he took us kind of a tour and walked around. And he talked about missing just like, uh, even though it's like a lot of horrible things, like uh, uh, kind of the sleaziness of New York. Do you, do you miss that? Now, that's a weird uh, question. Um, generally speaking, I don't miss sleaziness anywhere. Uh, <laughs> but it wasn't, you know, it wasn't sleazy for me because... Um, it was a it was a time of of grand adventure and kind of personal self definition. I was living in New York, and you know uh, I had friends, and I hung out in Central Park, and I went to concerts, and I hung out in the Village, and it was, you know, uh, it was just, you know, it was just a, a splendid time period. I, I, you know, I I just marvel at the fact that I that that the universe gave that to me. Mm-hmm. Yeah, sleaze is probably a bad word. It's just more, uh, I guess, character. Uh, yeah, I, I, yeah, I think, yeah. Then that I would say to you, I miss, I miss a lot of the, the, the kind of things. But then again, you know, this generation has what this is. In thirty, forty sure. years, now somebody will be asking somebody else that <laughs> <Right>? question. <laughs> that <laughs> yeah, very it's true. A, it's yeah, it's a moving sidewalk, man. It just keeps, you know, it just keeps going. Yeah, yeah. Now, did did you have your did you like uh have your teeth blackened for the movie or like things in between your teeth yeah they that was that was makeup <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> well yeah well i just wondered like uh what was that exactly in your teeth what was it yeah it was just um i don't know whatever makeup that that, that t- there's there's actual stuff that's for teeth blackening that sure so uh-huh. you can, it's real makeup that's what it's for so they use that yeah no uh to to to, to, to to fast forward ahead, because you mentioned the Ebert review for for this, uh, there's also another famous review for another movie you had you worked on a little bit, Chaos, and it, yes. his review is just horrible for that. And then there was a bunch yes. of back and forth with David DeFalco, which was wasn't between wasn't between David as much between David DeFalco as it was the guy who was the the main producer of the movie. Oh, David no. DeFalco was the writer and the director, but all of that other stuff was arranged by uh, uh, that other fellow. Mm-hmm. So what did you think of what did you think of that at the time? And uh, Chaos I, itself is kind of a remake of uh, Last House. It, well, I, you know, I don't think of it since I know what was on David DeFalco and I are good friends mm-hmm. and, and have and have remained pals uh, uh, over over the years. Um, his, I don't think of it as a remake. He grew up in Boston, okay, in mm-hmm. uh, in Needham, I think, and went to see last house at the drive-ins there and saw and fell in love with it. Just, it was like, you know, uh, the it was inspiration. Just, yeah. It was like a movie. He went, he used to go see over and over again. And when he first met me, when I, when we first met David and I were at a convention of uh, uh, some convention that was out at a hotel by LAX and David DeFalco sought us out because he wanted to meet us. He was, in awe of the film so i when he decided he was going to do chaos it wasn't so much a remake as it was his personal homage to it mm-hmm. uh, it was it was his honoring the film as opposed to trying to remake it yeah so that's a uh, yeah inspiration or something but is a better term kind of like uh wes with uh virgin spring exactly Ex- a very good very good uh, analogy yeah so, um, so what, what, do you remember when you first saw the Ebert review of Chaos? And, and oh, I of, laughed my ass off uh-huh. because because the moment the moment you know um, I saw it, I, I 
I, you know, they were saying to me, well, why, why is he saying this? And yet he said such nice things about good things about last house. I said, because last house existed before this. And I, I, it, he doesn't, Ebert doesn't give a shit about your homage. He gives a shit about the film. And, uh, uh, a lot of times I, I agree with a basic premise about remakes and homages is that if the first film didn't exist, is there any reason for the second film to see the light of day? And sometimes if, you know, the cold hard truth of that is the, the answer is no, you know, so, um, I just kind of laughed. Look, I was a gun for hire there. They, I, I was hired to, you know, uh, uh, make sure certain things got done. I was hired to, you know, uh, look at look at the script and just say, does this seem okay? And I would say, yeah, you know, it's. I knew that, you know, there was not a lot of money to spend on. There was a it was same a similar uh, uh, budget as Last House, only moving forward in in the economy. So, you know. I, I just figured they wanted me. They were paying me. Uh, I did my job, and that was that. Yeah. Now, uh, with David DeFalco, uh, I know you worked on a, a movie with Rob Van Dam that was in it. I'm a big wrestling fan, so. Uh, yeah. I, was... I, I I did some consulting on that. Okay. All right. Uh, the, did you have any interaction with RBD? Oh, yeah. We're good friends. Oh, very cool. Which, we... From your previous statement about uh, as uh, when you're 21, what your goals were, I do uh, would assume you do have something in common with RVD. Oh yeah, <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, we established that very quickly. Yeah, yeah, I've he's, interviewed him several great. times. He's he's a very good guy. He's you know the 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 biggest secret about about Rob is that he's a whole lot smarter than you would think he is. <laughs> mm-hmm. yeah, <laughs> he is yeah, he's a smart. A terrific guy i mean i've I, I one of those people one of those kind of celebrity friendships that i have that i truly enjoy because he's such a cool guy he's he's fun to hang out with and uh yeah he's a g- good man yeah uh did, are you a wrestling fan i used to be i mean i don't like, watch it now i, I mm-hmm. grew up in pittsburgh and you know in the days of bruno san martino uh-huh. so yeah. uh and ace freeman was my neighbor so uh i i had some some uh, connection to it then as, as a grown man uh with children i've done enough wrestling I don't want <laughs> fair enough fair enough yeah. i've also I'm interviewed bruno san martino by the way so. oh yeah yeah cool. very cool uh <laughs> real quick story about bruno san martino was at a wrestling convention and uh, i was probably in my mid-30s at the time and all of us were very tired we were up all night drinking whatever and uh we were out uh by this pool and here he comes jogging around he's like 80 years old and we just all felt so like uh, so depressed. We're like, man, this guy's way better shape than any of us. Oh yeah, he's <laughs> he was he was always in good shape. So it's good to hear that. Uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. So, um, are you a horror movie fan? Sometimes, if the story's good, mm-hmm. you know, I'm not I'm not uh, someone who just likes likes to go look at special effects because so what, you know? Uh, right. It's got to be a good story. Mm-hmm. What are some of your favorites? Oh, let's see. Well, The Exorcist, you know. Yeah, that's fantastic. Because uh, it had a good story. Um, Last House, actually, I don't, I can't really say it's one of my favorites because I was in it, but it does have a story. Uh, I think the early Saw movies uh, were were interesting. Um, you know, uh, Halloween, mm-hmm. early. Uh the, the you know the the original Freddy Krueger the one that Wes did I thought was pretty good, mm-hmm. um, you know Clive Barker's stuff is excellent. Yeah, no worries there. Yeah, so yeah. you know I, I'm I'm pretty mainstream when it comes to that. I don't like I don't like horror films that are overproduced. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think that's I think when you spend I think there's a danger and a trap if you have too much money to spend because you then start to overproduce something and that that diminishes the i think i think horror horror films have uh because they're about horror they have a certain rawness and they're trying to appeal to a raw emotion and i think if you overproduce something it has a tendency to uh mitigate that yeah that's something when uh last house is very gritty and it's almost like uh when I mean watching a dirty movie, I don't mean like a, a porn movie, but there's there's something dirty about it when you're watching it. Well, I and, told uh, David I think that's very appealing. Yeah, I told David DeFalco. I said, look, 
when we were doing chaos, I said, however this movie turns out, I can tell you that one of the secrets to Last House on the Left was that uh, whether intentionally or not, what Wes did was kind of lift a window uh, and allow the audience to watch a horrible crime in progress and be able to do, to be powerless to do anything about it. Mm-hmm. And I said it. Th- that's why I think that's I think a fundamental emotion with Last House is that they, none of us were known. None of us had there were, there were no recognizable faces in it. So as far as the audience knew, we could have been those people. And that, <laughs> right. No, that that added to yeah. the suspense of disbelief. And and, uh, uh, you know, it created this this kind of pseudo documentary uh, about a crime in progress and shit. You can't do anything about it. Yeah, that's actually a really good point because uh, uh, even no ma- no matter how good an actor is, if you do kn- you, if you do know who he is, uh, you automatically know it's a movie when you're watching it. Even if right. you still know it's a movie, you know even subconsciously you can uh, suspend disbelief yeah. and get into it. That's, that's an interesting point. So, did you ever watch? Well, I assume you have since then. But uh, when it first came out, did you watch the movie with an audience? Um, let me see. I think the, that what happened was, um, yeah, I think David and I, uh, it was when it, when it played in New York, one of the places it was playing was up uh, on, I think at the Lowy's uh, on 86th Street on the east side. And I think he and I kind of sneaked in uh, <laughs> to watch it with an audience. And, uh, and then I'd seen it, you know, then I was on a little press tour and I went back to Pittsburgh and saw it in a in a, a theater that I used to go to when I was a kid a big theater that my cousin my father's cousin was the manager of so that was kind of ironic yeah. uh, uh, and I watched it with a crowded audience like with, like with a full house and that was pretty fucking weird <laughs> yeah I was just saying does anything pop out like I just I don't know how people reacted at the time you know they were horrified they were yeah. like, you know they were shocked I mean people are still the, the the odd thing uh, that I'm both in awe of and you know grateful for is that he, for some reason this is a this is a cross generational film. Mm-hmm. Uh, it last house every new generation finds it somehow, and I can tell you from being at at uh, conventions that the age of uh, fan who comes up to my table to talk to me or or to get my autograph. These it could be anybody from fourteen, fifteen to you know people my age and maybe older. It's it's amazing. So mm-hmm. who the who knows how that shit happens? Yeah, it's that's interesting because I I like to watch old Siskel and Ebert's uh, on YouTube. I just find them entertaining. I grew up watching it, and part of it's you know nostalgia. Part of it's just you know to watch it. And there's so many movies that are on there that really are just forgotten in time. Yeah, and, uh, and then he, it does make me think when I'm watching. It's like, why do some movies, you know, hold up or people keep going back to them? And some of these movies, even if they were, some of them were up for award, awards and stuff, and I, I barely even remember the remember name. Or don't even remember. Yeah, it's yeah, very, it's very odd. But but you know, uh, uh, for some reason, and I could sit here with you for hours and come up with come up with reasons, but who knows if they're really real or not? But for mm-hmm. some reason. As a matter of absolute fact, this film continues to uh, uh, gather an audience and continues like, you know, Arrow Arrow Films is releasing the new Blu-ray. And by the way, uh, uh, they sent me uh, uh, a kind of a list of all the, the elements that are going to be on this uh, uh, piece. And if you're a fan of Last House on the Left, I don't know how you don't buy this. Because it's got everything. This is this is probably the quintessential Last House on the Left fan uh, thing to own because it's got everything. Yeah, Arrow puts out like great releases because uh, it seems like the people who are behind it really love these movies. And then, uh, like I said, the, if you like the movie, you get the movie itself, obviously, and it's restored. But then all the extras. Yeah, uh, this is a weird thing to say. Even some because they send me some review and stuff. Even some of the movies I might not even like the movie so much. Uh, it's the extras make me love the the release of the, the Blu-ray. Yeah. It, it sounds weird, but it, it makes you. Sometimes it makes you uh, not actually like the movie, but you have like a, a more respect for the movie. 
Or well, you just you, enjoy all the stuff, you know? Yeah, and it gives you a greater understanding, you know, yeah. uh, of of the process of what what goes into it. I mean, on this Blu-ray, there, I think there there's one big interview with me, and then there's a, a lot of archival footage of me and David and Freddie and Wes and Sean, so and all of us. So I, I, I you know, I, I'm objectively saying that that uh, anyone who's a fan of of Last House, uh, of, this is the this is it, man. This is you know, yeah. And I think they're going to have those. I guess at uh, at Frightmares when it's going to be released. Yeah, I guess. So that's gonna be pretty cool, and you and you'll be there. So I will be. Can, Jeremy, yeah, I you will can get be. the, yeah, you get the Blu-ray and uh, get it signed by you guys. That'd be sweet. Yep. Mm-hmm. Uh, when you actually talk to uh, people who like the movie, what are some of their reasons? And are, are you ever surprised by people's uh, what they take away from the movie? Um, let me see. There, I think you know we've covered a lot of their reasons. A lot of the reasons I think. Uh, uh, people found it like great escapism. People say that, you know, it, it's so real that they've never been scared by anything more than this. Uh, people talk about David and, uh, uh, Krug. And, you know, I remember when, when David and I would do these shows together, uh, uh, the number of times that David would get asked to say, piss your pants was, uh, (laughs) astronomical, you know, and people would come up to me and ask me to do the frog and, uh, you know, it's just, it's, I was, we, we were at a, a convention in Ohio a few years ago and th- there was a long line to get to us. And all of a sudden these two guys appeared and they were like, like, uh, versions of, uh, of, uh, uh Bill and Ted's excellent adventure, you know, the, the, you know, was it, yeah. Keanu, Reeves, was it Keanu Reeves and, uh, uh, yeah, I forget the other guy's name, yeah, but yeah. Right. So, so, uh, I, I looked up and one of them just looked at me and said, dude, and I said, dude, and then the other <laughs> one said, dude, and I <laughs> said, dude, and then they both said, dude, together. And then one of them <laughs> said to me, dude, we drove six hours to see you. And I, in that moment, I just was. I was like humbled, you know, not yeah. just like why? Cause I kept thinking, you know, people who know me and love me wouldn't drive six hours to see me, <laughs> you know, so I, I, I was, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm really humbled by the fact that something I did in the woods in Connecticut in 1971, uh, is still around and people still are moved by it. And I will never stop being, uh, uh, affected by that. I, yeah. I just, uh, you know, wow. <laughs> mm-hmm. Uh, I got some questions here from uh, our Facebook when I mentioned sure. you're coming on, uh, John Campbell, uh, kind of like we were talking about right now, when you were filming last house and left, did you ever think that it would turn out to be such a classic that it has become? Absolutely not. <laughs> <laughs> I just hadn't. No. Uh, first of all, I had no, you know, I had no, parameters by which to even make that judgment uh i was very caught up in the fact that wow i'm i'm 21 and i'm in a movie and uh i'm having the time of my life so no i had no idea (laughs) yeah uh so uh did you yourself get any backlash uh both from within the industry and his everyday life from last house being so controversial absolutely not no, and if I did, I never knew about it. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's fair enough. Uh, how about you, like your family, uh, the, the family and friends? Well, what do they think of the movie? Um, my father uh, uh, could could watch the entire movie up until the point where I shoot myself, and mm-hmm. uh, every time that's he would understandable, he would see he would go to a screening. He would literally get up and walk out and say to me, "I can't watch that," and yeah. you know. Okay. But other than that, you know, my, my, uh, let's see, um, my brothers and sisters thought it was a hoot, uh, parents, you know, just, I mean, I told you how my father was. I, Mm -hmm. I never really talked to my mother about it, uh, in any detail. Um, and then, fr- no, I just, no, not really. That was the only thing I recall was my father's emotional response to, to that scene. Yeah. How about filming that scene? Was it, uh, 
What was that like? I mean, uh, David Hess's performance in that's pretty, pretty amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it, it was, uh, tedious because it had to be done in pieces <laughs> uh-huh. and they, and, uh, they had to sew a, uh, prosthetic brain part into the back of my head by, uh, by using my hair as threads. So, so that took quite a while. Uh, but other than that, you know, it was, it was a day's work. <laughs> sure. Yeah. Uh, Barry Dominey wants to know, uh, why did you give up on acting after such a memorable performance? Because, um, Let's see the the re- one of the things that the the epiphanies that I had during that production, hearkening back to what I said to you about me learning every th- the fundamentals of everything I, I've learned about filmmaking there, I realized that I just didn't want to be an actor, that I wanted to I wanted to do what Wes was doing, what Sean was doing. I wanted to be more involved in in the production as a storyteller rather than just as an element of the story. So I just, uh, you know, uh, tried to to make that happen, and uh, to a, a certain degree, I did. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I actually saw on your IMDb you did you did uh, wrote a lot of sitcoms and stuff throughout the years. Oh yeah, it's pretty cool. Yes, I did. Mm-hmm. Yep. Uh, uh, w- when the sitcom started to uh, now they've there's there's uh, kind of a comeback, but there was a time maybe about ten years ago when the sitcom kind of it was like kind of the death of the sitcom. Uh, did that affect uh, your career at all? Uh, yes, you know, things, sl- <laughs> things slowed down and, you know, then I, but I did some consulting work on scripts and, uh, wrote, you know, did wrote a script for a company in Australia and, you know, I managed to get through, like I said, I've, I've, I've had a, a, a pretty successful mediocre career. I've always been able to, uh, to find something to do. Yeah. It seems like they're coming back. Like, uh, even yeah. old ones, obviously Roseanne and uh, Fuller house and then, uh, uh, why do you think they went away? And why do you think they come back? Is it just things are just cyclical? Yeah, that's it. You know, it's that's exactly what it is. You know, it, all the, what happens is uh, you know, there there's a hit show, uh, let's say a hit sitcom, and then for five years uh, everybody wants a sitcom, and then there isn't a hit show for a while, and it dies down, and then suddenly there's a hit show, and then we, we're back there. So it's just <laughs> just right. like that. Yeah, kind of like after uh, I think um, uh, the Sopranos, everything was anti-heroes, right? For the last ten years, yeah, which is fine, but it, it's uh, kind of uh, like I said, cyclical. Um, Robbie Scar wants to know: Did the script make you cringe? Uh, I wouldn't say cringe. I just kind of laughed, <laughs> uh-huh. you know, because it wasn't real for us. Sure, you know, we we I don't think you know if an actor who decides to do a part. You make the decision, I'm going to do it. You know, it is what it is. You, you say yes or you say no. And uh, then you go and you, you, do, you do it or you don't do it. Mm-hmm. Uh, Stephen Butler, what do you think of the torture porn movies of today, like Hostel movies by Eli Roth? I'm not a fan of hurting anyone. <laughs> I just, I, <laughs> that, I'm, if, it, if it doesn't have a story, if, if, if torturing and the torture porn is the main focus, I'm... It's, it it has a right to exist, but it's not for me. Yeah, yeah. Uh, what made you actually want to become an actor in the first place? Um, well, like I said, I had those three life goals. Right. So it was a it was a mean I figured, I, yeah, I figured the 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 easier that you know. Well, here's what happened. Uh, um, I got the part in Last House, and um, I was doing this little tour that that of going to cities and you know doing little press stuff and it happened to be in pittsburgh and i ended up because of last house sleeping with a whole bunch of girls from high school that uh um wouldn't give me the fucking time of day uh-huh. and i said now nah, i think this is a correct career decision uh, <laughs> i think i made the right choice here this is you know so um there you go <laughs> yeah yeah i'd I'm sure that's because uh, it's no nowhere to compare. But just doing interviews, like I have the pictures of me and Malcolm McDowell, or whatever, on my Facebook, and, and people that did not talk to me at all in high school, all of a sudden act like we're best friends. And, and oh, of course, you, right? Oh, <laughs> absolutely. Yeah, man. It's like uh, uh, you know, uh, wow. <laughs> this this is that this is all I had to do. You know, okay. 
I'll keep doing this or some <laughs> version of it. Right, exactly. <laughs> uh, uh, so I want to ask, because we, we mentioned a lot about the Ebert review. What were the other reviews like at the time? Oh, they were shit. Yeah. They were, yeah, they, you, they were, you know, it was, it was one uh, minus four star review after another. This is the worst thing ever. You know, uh, I think the Catholic Church wrote a review and condemned us. Uh, uh, you know, uh, I think they gave us a lower rating than the exorcist. Uh, I mean, they just know people, you know, the, the conservative, uh, in the box, uh, uh, media just trashed it. Mm -hmm. uh, when you saw those before the Ebert reviews, like, uh, before the Ebert review came out, uh, what, what were you thinking about, you know, this movie you made? I don't know. I was just thinking, yeah, okay, you know, of course. <laughs> <laughs> it was it was to be expected, I assume. Yeah, it didn't it didn't seem far from reality, you know. The, right. Yeah, that's pretty much what it was. <laughs> it was the Ebert review that was the one that was surprising. The, the Ebert review was the definite outlier. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, uh, what are what are are you up to anything to uh, right not uh, well not right this minute, but uh, any uh, projects in the works uh, recently? I have I have um, one. Uh, pilot script uh, for like a I'm going to say 30 minute dark comedy uh, that takes place in Pittsburgh in 1964 called When America Was Great and it's uh, the story of a 14 year old boy and his father and the, the body of the series takes place in the time we meet uh, these two characters when he's 14 and his father is like in his mid forties until he leaves home and goes away to college. So it's that four year period. And, and, uh, I I've written a, it's a very edgy, very dark kind of coming of age. If you can imagine like a, 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 a gritty wonder years, you know, it's like, uh, that sounds awesome to me. So. Coming of coming of age. So I'm partners. My producing partner is uh, a fellow by the name of Gary Hart who for uh, quite a few years uh, was the president of Paramount Network Television. And we're fr he and I are friends since my Charles in Charge days. Uh, so uh, Gary is out trying to sell it. And it's at a major studio right now. Uh, uh, we're waiting to hear back. And, you know, it's one of these off-network streaming 12-episode-a-season kind of things. And if it happens, it happens. If it doesn't, oh, well. But I'm doing that. And I'm back doing stand-up. Oh, very cool. Uh, whereabouts did you stand up? Um, I right now. Well, I used to. I, I was part of uh, uh, that comedy store class of 1977 that included uh, Robin Williams and David Letterman and Jay Leno uh -huh. and uh, Billy Crystal. Yeah, and Richie Lewis. I'm I'm th that era, and part. I'm, I'm actually my name is one of the names on the wall uh, outside the comedy store on the uh, outside walls, and so my, I have a lot of background in that, and, and that, it, it was uh, Mitzi Shore, the owner of the comedy store. It was her, when she put me on, when I, when I passed through her uh, 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 thing and, and became a regular at the comedy store, that's kind of what kicked off uh, uh, my sitcom career and my comedy writing career in L.A. So I've been back, not at the comedy store, I've been just doing these little clubs in, in the Valley uh, kind of getting my sea legs back. And, you know, at some point in time, if I feel like I'm uh, good enough, I'll, uh, I'll try to get back up to the store, but I'm just doing it right now. Cause I love doing it and I'm having a blast. That's very cool. Any, uh, any, uh, stories that stand out from the, from the seventies era? Um, I can tell you a Hess story, uh, uh, All uh right. about Hess and me. Mm -hmm. Um, David was, um, Every letter in the word bombastic. Uh, and, and as I mentioned, he was a bull in the china shop of life. So uh, uh, he and he was a great teaser of people. He was uh, always one to to pick up on something and keep teasing it. So I'm of uh, um, Eastern European uh, Jewish descent and I have a lot of hair on my chest. So uh, uh, David and I shared an apartment and he used to see me. And would call me the monkey. That was his uh, nickname for me. The monkey this, the monkey that. And you know, I didn't give a shit because, uh, you know, David and I were good friends. And he, I, I really didn't care. So uh, right after we did Last House, 
we took a skiing trip. We we guys got the guys to who funded Last House uh, out of Boston, Hallmark Releasing, to give us some money to go write another script. And David made the preposterous point that the only place we could write this script was in the French Alps, and they <laughs> bought it. <laughs> <laughs> so, and David was a, 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 a like a ski patrol class skier. He was an excellent skier, and I was you know a beginner but okay, athletic but okay. So we're over there and. Uh, uh, we established a kind of a routine that every day uh, we would do our skiing and then we, we would meet at this uh, uh, kind of indoor outdoor cafe bar al- along the slopes uh, for drinks and uh, snacks. And then we would go back to the condo that we rented. So uh, uh, one day I show up there and David is sitting at a table with a half a dozen uh, uh, kind of Austrian German Nazi ski guys, you know, and there's there's clinging steins of beer together and drinking and having this uh, 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 amazing uh, Bavarian party here in the, the French Alps. So I come over and David sees me and he starts screaming, oh, there's the monkey. And I go, oh, shit. So <laughs> I sit down and, you know, kind of blend in and have a drink. And I see David is with a girl and turns out she's an American girl that David had uh, picked up. And uh, she was traveling through and, you know, David was uh, a a womanizer at times. So, you know, he saw her and glommed on to her. So we're having a drink. And the girl said to David, "Uh, um, you know, uh, uh, I've been traveling all day. I'd like to take a shower. Uh, Do you have a place I could take a shower? So David said to her, yeah, the monkey will take you back to our condo. And he (laughs) turns to me and says, monkey, take her back to the condo. I said, what? To just take her back to the condo. You know, he was showing off for these uh, Nazi guys, right? Uh-huh. So, so um, I was tired of this shit anyway. Uh, so I said, sure, why not? So take the girl and we go walk back to the condo. And we're inside. And uh, uh, I say, bathroom's in there. Kitchen is right here. I'm going to just sit here and watch TV. Uh, go do what you need to do. David will be back, you know, whenever he rolls in. So I turn the TV on. I hear the water running in the shower and uh, uh, no less than five minutes after that, she comes walking out of the bathroom wrapped in nothing but a towel with her hair wet. And, you know, and she said to me, listen, I've been in a car all day long and my neck is really kind of tight. You think you could uh, massage like here? And she points to the back of her neck and her shoulders. And I think to myself, well, I may be just 21 years old, but I know what the fuck is going on here. <laughs> so I said, yeah, sure. Why not? So she sits down next to me. And uh, 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 the moment she sits down, the fucking towel drops away. So I start rubbing her neck. And then she starts rubbing uh, uh, my leg. And one thing leads to another. And we start fucking. So as we're fucking, the door barrels open. And it's Hess. <laughs> and he stares at us and he screams drunk as a fucking skunk. He screams, what the fuck is going on here? And I just looked up at him and said, well, apparently the monkey is having his banana peeled. <laughs> and David, to his credit, uh, a- a- as my friend and my brother, just laughed, turned around and walked back out. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. So, yeah, that's a great story. That is an absolutely <laughs> true story that I have told in front of him. Okay, uh, uh, t- to his amusement, mm-hmm. you know. So that's uh, that's my favorite Hess story. That and the, there's another one, but it's not as funny as that. <laughs> Very cool. Though. So anyway, you can see uh, yourself and uh, and and Jeremy uh, Texas Frightmare. I'll be there as well. Okay, uh, come by and say hello, please. Definitely will. Definitely will. Uh, Texas Fright Bear is a great convention. I've been there for uh, the last four or five years, except for a year when I was very sick and almost died. But uh, besides that, I'm always uh, always there. It's a great convention. Yeah, it's I really just, packed uh, and big. I know? just got I just got an agent uh, uh, who who has decided to book me in conventions and asked me if I wanted to have an agent to book me in conventions. So I finally said yes to that. Oh, very cool. Well, yeah, I think you'll have a good time. Yeah, could be fun. Yeah. So I'll definitely see you there. And uh, this has been great. Uh, I love this interview. Love talking to you. Okay.
It, it's yeah. been a pleasure. I, I appreciate it. I, stay safe out there in uh, in the Boston area. You know, don't uh, don't freeze your nuts off. <laughs> oh, very, thank you. Oh, by the way, since you mentioned uh, about uh, how how could t- if someone out there listening would like to book you at a convention, how would they get in touch? Uh, the, the, the agency is called, I think 13th level booking and promotion mm-hmm. and they're on Facebook Cool. or, or that I, the, it's 13th level, uh, booking.com, something like that. Uh, Jason is the agent. Mm-hmm. So, uh, yeah, cool. absolutely. Yeah. Are you on uh, social media at all for people to follow I, I'm you? On, I'm on Facebook all right, and, cool. and Twitter, uh, uh, at, um, uh, at M five Mark. All right. Very cool. Well, again, thanks. It's been great. All right, man. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. You have a good one. You too. Hi, I'm Poncha Moeller from Rob Zombie's 31 movie. I play Sickhead. I'm coming at you. You are listening to Without Your Head. Stay tuned.